Well, it is 2 o'clock. Uh, again, this is Steve Marcel. We're going to get started. Um, as a as kind of an administrative reminder, if you could please uh, mute your phone when uh, you're not talking. Uh, we do want to keep the line open so that if you do have any questions, that you can ask them. Uh, but uh, uh, the background noise can become distracting if uh, uh, if you, you have your phone unmuted when you're not speaking. So. Um, again, my name is Steve Marzoff. I'm the Integrated Services Program Director for VITA, and uh, we wanted to put on this uh, webinar today to talk about secondary PSAPs and Next Generation 911. Um, many of you uh, may have been following um, what we've been working on over the last two years or so with Next Generation 911, and some of you may have not. So we wanted to make sure that we um, uh, review kind of the uh, where we're going, how it's going to impact you potentially, and, and the ways we know it's going to impact you going forward. Um, this is the start of a conversation. So, um, you know, we, we do are going to need your help over the next few years as we start to migrate to Next Generation 91. Uh, next slide, please, Stephanie. So our agenda is first to talk about what is Next Generation 9-1, how we're going to deploy it in Virginia, and then what the specific is in, impact is to secondary PSAPs, the funding that may be available, um, and then uh, legislation that the board, the 911 Services Board, is considering for uh, this coming legislative session in January of 2018, and then what we see the next steps as being. Next slide, please. So just kind of as a review of kind of why we're doing all of this, um, if you haven't been involved, is you know really um, the current 911 network out there is, has, has got challenges. Um, first, you know, there are the, the technology challenges. Um, we have multiple providers out there now. We have wireless, we have wireline, we have voice over IP, we have multi-line telephone systems all trying to access, uh, you know, an antiquated uh, analog network. Um, New technologies and, and uh, uh, applications continue to be developed. You may have heard uh, this past year about a, a product or a, an app um, for the iPhone uh, called Haven from uh, a company called Rapid SOS. And, uh, you know, their, um, uh, their, their claim to fame or the application's intent is to be a better uh, solution for 911, to provide better location information, and to um, actually augment uh, the 911 system. So those types of innovations, technology innovations, are going to continue to, to come uh, towards us. Plus, um, you know, the, the solution providers, the telecommunications providers, used to be local. When I uh, was up in Prince William County, the president of Contel lived in our county. Uh, now these solutions are being rolled out at the national and even global level. Um, and it's all because uh, citizens are demanding increased mobility and flexibility in, in telecommunications. Um, the, the days of having a wired phone that had a specific location you know, are long since past. The 9-1 system itself is challenged by its architecture. Um, most people uh, don't even realize that there are actually nine independent networks in Virginia. There is not one single E911 network. Um, throughout the state. There are seven provided by Verizon and two that are provided by uh, CenturyLink. Um, and those systems, those networks are analog based, so they have very limited ability to process data. Uh, they don't have, a, um, uh, in fact, the, all the data that we can receive through the 911 system is actually 512 characters on the um, on the alley display, and that is just 512 characters. Um, uh, so, but the bottom line and the real push for Next Gen 911 is that the current network that we use for 911 is going away. Uh, Verizon and CenturyLink are migrating to uh, IP-based systems uh, for just general telephone uh, now, and and you know, to things like Fios and, uh, and and those types of technologies that the analog technologies 
that we've uh, had in the past are being decommissioned. So we don't want to be the last users of this network or this infrastructure. Um, you know, we want to be able to migrate off gracefully. Next slide, please. So what exactly is NextGen 911? Well, it's going from that analog or circuit switched network uh, to a packet switched or IP network. Uh, you know, IP is Internet Protocol. It's the same technology used for the Internet. And most of the telecommunications traffic that's out there is now IP-based, um, again, except for the 911 network. It is going to be a complete upgrade. Uh, the selective routers, tandems, 911 switches, whatever you want to call them, are going away. So is the Alley database, ALI, or Automatic Location Identification Database, and the Master Street Address Correct Guide, or MSAG, are all going away. Um, it, it is a forklift upgrade. Now, this doesn't isn't necessarily going to need to be a single system. I know I just said one of the problems with the old or the current network is it's nine independent networks, but it can be a system of systems, and it's going to need to be able to roll up it to the state level and ultimately to a national level. Um, and and you know, you think of it much like the internet. The Internet, we talk about it as if it's a single thing, but it's really not. It's a collection of thousands and thousands of of networks that are interconnected or internet uh, together to, to make what we call the Internet today. So um, that's the same sort of thing we're talking about for next generation 911. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, we, we have to do this because the, the new technologies like texting and, and not that texting is really new, but, but text messaging, the ability to get uh, pictures or video or those sorts of things into the PSAP are going to require this type of technology upgrade and investment. Um, and it's going to hopefully prepare us for better location accuracy. I do want to point out that some people have tied improved wireless location accuracy to NextGen, and it doesn't really by itself fix the location issue because ultimately the location that's provided, the longitude and latitude of the phone is is produced either by the phone or the cell network. But what it will do is allow us to have a better conduit to the wireless carriers of the world like Verizon and Sprint and those uh, in, in order to be able, once we can get improved accuracy from the carriers or more that location more quickly, we will be able to, to route on it as well. Next slide, please. So um, why in Virginia? Why are we really pushing it? Ultimately, that first one of the legacy network going away is the is the number one reason. Now, we are getting some background conversation. If you could please mute your phone, um, I would, we would really appreciate it. You can either hit uh, star six on the uh, conference bridge or just use mute on your on your phone. So we also, in addition to it, the network as we currently know it going away, we also want to uh, deliver the calls faster. Um, uh, most citizens out there don't realize that when you dial 911, the first ring they hear is not heard in the center. It's not until the second ring that the call actually gets processed. And that's because the analog circuits take time to set up and transmit information. So as a result, it's 8 to 13 second delay um, from the time the call is uh, uh, dialed until the number is dialed until it's uh, routed to the to the PSAP. Um, we also, because we have nine independent networks, we don't have the ability to transfer calls across networks. So places like New Kent and James City County, because they're served by two different selective router pairs aren't able to um, to transfer calls with data between the two. Uh, that's something that next gen 911 will fix. Um, it'll also allow us to interconnect the public safety uh, systems and databases. So you could interconnect things like your computer aided dispatch systems or your records management systems for, for fire or law enforcement. Um, you could do uh, medical information. There, there, is a, there are a number of things that you would be able to share among localities once this network is established. And then ultimately, as I mentioned, the, also the ability to receive uh, the 
communications, and I'll say it as in the way that our citizens communicate, whether it be text messaging or um, uh, photos or videos or, or that sort of thing, because you'll have the connectivity to the carriers uh, that can transmit data. Next slide, please. So what does this all look like? Well, this is, uh, we call this our 9-1 ecosystem slide, and what's up there right now is just the way it is today. On the left, you have the carriers. Um, at the top, you have the public switch telephone network or the landline phone service. In the middle, you have the wireless carriers who um, connect cell towers to mobile switching centers uh, and mobile positioning centers. Um, and then down at the bottom, you have voice over IP, which is done through the Internet. But somewhere on the Internet is a phone switch that processes that call. Um, and all of those route to what is currently the selective router and uses the um, MSAG and Alley databases to route that call to the correct PSAP. Now, um, the secondary PSAPs then would be subsequent to that either having the call transferred through the selective router or from the uh, call handling equipment or, or customer premise equipment in the PSAP having it route to uh, through a 10-digit number to the appropriate uh, uh, secondary PSAP. Next slide. What we're talking about adding is this new cloud down there at the bottom, and, and that is the Emergency Services IP Network, or ESINET. Um, ESI net, ESI net, however you want to call it. But essentially all those same providers, wireline, wireless, and voice over IP, would connect through points of interconnection, which are basically firewalls, to the ESI net and be able to route calls. Um, within that ESI net bubble is a, um, our databases, uh, geospatial databases, that will allow us to locate the the caller and then route to the correct PSAP. So essentially, there'll be um, uh, the address point database or a centerline database to be able to take a civic address, um, you know, one two three Main Street, and find it to a longitude and latitude or an X Y that says, okay, this is where this this is. Now, if it's a wireless call and we get longitude and latitude with the call, then that's great. We have what we need to be able to route to the correct PSAP then that longitude and latitude is then um, laid on top of the PSAP boundaries, uh, which is a, a GIS file of, of polygons that says, okay, every square inch of the state goes to some PSAP. So wherever we locate this point that the person's calling from, whether it be a, an address or a cell phone out in the field, um, that it will then route to a PSAP based on whose polygon that point is uh, located in. So it um, then will route through IP to the to the PSAP. One of the big advantages to this approach is that uh, the, the, the connectivity, where currently the connectivity is analog and can only support voice, this connectivity is IP and can support data at the same time. So uh, where currently you have to do rebids and and, and get additional information and wait for information to populate, the information will be there with the call and they'll be integrated. Uh, so that as long as you have the voice, you'll also have the data and the data can update at the same time. Next slide, please. So that's basically what NextGen is. It's just really a technology refresh of the 911 network. Now, how we plan to deploy it in Virginia is you know, we had a feasibility study in January of 2015. And if you haven't read it and you're having insomnia, it's about 350 pages of technical dry information. But uh, you know, if you haven't seen it, I'd encourage you to look at it and, and you know, at, at least look at things that, like the recommendations that they provided in it. Um, that then was used to help develop a comprehensive plan uh, in July of 2015. Both of those documents are on our website under the board, uh, the E91 Services Board tab. And, you know, again, you can download them and, and look at and read them. Um, but the comprehensive plan really kind of laid out 
how we're going to move forward with 911 in general, not just next gen, all of 911, um, but uh, they're really kind of our guiding our guiding documents here. Um, because we finished the planning, we are now shifting from a planning mode to implementation mode. And what we've realized is, though we'd love to be able to say people can migrate whenever they're ready, the reality is that we're going to have to migrate by selective router pair. So those 911 switches that there are uh, 18 of them around the state, um, seven pairs of Verizon and two pairs of um, CenturyLink, um, we're, we're going to have to do it in an organized way in order to keep costs down. Uh, basically, Verizon and CenturyLink can't retire those selective routers until everyone is off of them. So as an example, there's currently a project up in northern Virginia uh, to start working on this migration. Um, we're going to have to make sure that every locality up there migrates to NextGen in order to be able to have Verizon stop charging for those selective routers. Um, anyone who doesn't go may have the unfortunate uh, situation where they're, uh, they're paying the cost for the entire selective router rather than being able to share it with other localities as, as is done now because the cost of those selective routers is, is somewhat fixed and as a result, you know, the fewer localities that they have to spread the cost across, the more it's going to end up costing those localities. So, um, so that's why we really have to and we're really focused on this idea of selective router pair by pair. Now, we had a committee of the Regional Advisory Council um, put together a recommendation of how they think that that should occur. But until we select a, a vendor uh, to help us with this deployment, we're not going to know what that deployment schedule is. Um, we also recognize, though, that there are some things that we can be working on now. One of those is GIS data preparation. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Next Gen 911 is going to be driven by GIS data. And those uh, PSAP boundary files, those polygons that lay out, for, again, every square inch of Virginia, where does the call route, that's going to have to be created. That doesn't exist today. Uh, the road center line and address points, uh, we do get those from every locality currently, and uh, we'll continue to, to, to use those um, in order to, but, but some localities need um, help refining those and, and improving those. So you know, we're looking at projects right now um, to, to help localities improve the quality of their GIS data. Um, we also, the, the next kind of thing that needs to be done is the idea of the ESINet setup. As I mentioned, Northern Virginia is working on that. Uh, they have an RFP out. It has not yet been awarded uh, to select a vendor to do that, that uh, setup of the IP network. And this would be as a, a network that is as redundant as possible um, that provides the level of, of service that we need for 911. And then on top of that network, there are the core services that uh, control the um, routing of the calls. There's a function called the location verification function LVF uh, or location validation function LVF that um, when uh, a telephone company or a, a communication service provider uh, puts in a new address, it validates. It's, it's analogous to the MSEG validation that we have today to make sure that the address they pass with the call later if a call is made is going to is going to validate. So all those services need to be developed and implemented on the ESINet. Next slide, please. So that same RAC committee um, sat down to say, okay, what are all those things going to cost? And the, we estimate that the statewide transition costs are $69 million. Now, we've identified some ways that we're going to cover that. One is the, the PSAP grant program. Um, we have at different times had some fairly broad guidelines that allowed funding for um, uh, you know, radio consoles and, and other things. And what we've done over the last few years and, and with the adoption of the 2019 grant guidelines, we are further refining and 
focusing the funding that we have on Next Generation 911. Um, we also currently pay Verizon and CenturyLink for routing wireless 911 calls. Well, in a next-gen world, we're not going to need to do that anymore, so that funding will become available. We also have a, a, a fund specifically for network improvements of a million dollars a year, and uh, that would be focused towards this. And then we also plan to try to eliminate the wireless carrier cost recovery. Currently, they're allowed to receive funding for uh, uh, for the cost of implementing the location technology on their end. Um, now that most of these technologies have been in place for more than 10 years and only two of the four major carriers are seeking this cost recovery, you know, we think it's time to, to go ahead and, and get rid of it. Now, all of that transition cost, the $69 million, is just to get us to deploy next generation 911. Then there are the ongoing costs, which you know, we're, we're hoping are going to be similar to the legacy costs, but they may go up or down for individual localities. Um, plus, we need to make sure that all of those costs that you're currently paying for 911 go away. And uh, so we're, the, the board has expressed interest in the idea of getting rid of the tariffs that you currently pay to either the LEX or the competitive local exchange carriers and CLEX. Um, to get rid of that, that funding so that that money can be directed to Next Generation 911. Next slide. So what's the impact to you as a secondary piece that? Well, first of all, we've identified there's really four different types of, of uh, secondary piece apps. And um, w while we identified all of you participating as potential secondaries, we don't necessarily know which one of these you are. So one of the things we're going to, we hope to have a result of this call uh, is you helping us identify what type of, of secondary piece app you are. First is the one that's full E911. That means you're connected to the selective routers. That means you're getting the alley information when you answer the call and you have call handling equipment in your center. Uh, an example of this that, that we know of is uh, the city of Manassas or the city of Manassas Park in Prince William. Um, they're secondary as it relates to wireless. No wireless call goes directly to uh, Manassas or Manassas Park. It goes to Prince William County first. But they do receive uh, wire line calls directly as a primary PSAP, and they get calls transferred to them from Prince William, and they get the location information on those wireless calls because they are connected to the selective routers. So... That's an example of a full E911. You're, you're paying Verizon for the or CenturyLink for the 911 service. You've got Annie and Allie. You've got um, records in the 911 database and uh, and so forth. So those are the ones that um, are of, of most concern, and I'll explain why in a in a moment. The second is where the secondary piece app is a node on some host's call handling equipment. Um, we understand an example of this would be like City of Fairfax to Fairfax. Used to be the City of Fairfax connected to the selective routers, but with the recent, relatively recent upgrade of Fairfax County's call handling system, equipment system, um, Fairfax went ahead and extended that system to the City of Fairfax. So therefore, they don't connect to the 91 network directly anymore. They connect to Fairfax County's system and the calls just, they go to Fairfax County and then are processed through the call handling equipment to the city of Fairfax. So, you know, clearly we want to make sure that these PSAPs understand what NextGen is, what's coming, how it will impact them, uh, but they're already off the selective router, so um, they're not as, as critical an issue um, for us moving forward. The third type of secondary PSAP, are the 10-digit number uh, transfer PSAPs. These would be ones um, where the call is transferred. Um, it, it could be campus police, it, uh, a campus police. It could be um, a, uh, a military installation. Um, but when the primary PSAP hits a, a, a call transfer button on their equipment, it actually dials a 10-digit number and goes out through the public switch telephone network to that um, to that center. 
so um, uh, to the secondary PSAP. Um, the third, or sorry, the fourth, the final, is what we call call information relay, and that is where the caller never really talks to the secondary PSAP. Instead, the primary PSAP takes the information and then either through an electronic means like computer aid dispatch or through verbal, through a phone call, the information is given to the secondary PSAP, but the the, the secondary PSAP never actually really talks to the caller. Um, so regardless of which one of these four you are, one of the 911 board's guiding principles is that there be no degradation in service um, as a result of the implementation of next generation 911. So we don't want to take away anything. We don't want to have a PSAP that's currently getting the calls with alley information and tell them that now they're going to um, go to a 10 digit transfer. That's just not going to work and, and not be feasible. So, um, so we know we absolutely, anyone who is a full E911 configuration, you're connected to the selective router, you are absolutely going to have to convert to next generation 911. You don't have a choice. It, it's going to have to happen. Um, because, again, we have to retire those selective routers. So to have uh, someone left on there is, is not going to be a workable solution. Um, Anyone who is a currently a 10-digit, as I mentioned, anybody who's a node on somebody else's call hand equipment, you're already taken care of because when whoever the host is implements NextGen, it will automatically be available to you as well. But if you're a 10-digit or if you're a call relay, you could or you would be permitted to join the NextGen ESINET. So if, and probably the best example of this is the Virginia State Police. Virginia State Police currently gets transferred calls on a 10-digit number. If the Virginia State Police wanted to look at migrating to where they are on the ESI net, they could do that, and then that way the calls would be transferred to them through the 911 or the next-gen 911 network, and they would get the same location information that the PSAP does, not like currently happens where they, all they get is the voice. But ultimately, and I want to stress this, ultimately we have committed to the primary PSAPs that they're the final determiner of routing. So if your secondary PSAP is within, say, um, Chesterfield County, and you want to have the calls routed directly to you um, through establishment of a PSAP boundary for, say, the town of Chester or something like that, Chesterfield County would have to sign off on that and say, yes, I agree that that's the appropriate routing and because ultimately they're the ones that are responsible now and we don't have nor do we want the authority to take that responsibility away from Chesterfield. It's up to the, the home PSAP, to the primary PSAP, to make the decision where calls are routed uh, within their jurisdictional boundaries. Next slide, please. So... I just told you you might be able to, to implement NextGen if you don't have it already, or that you might have to implement it if you're one of those full E911 uh, secondary PSAPs and you don't have a choice. Well, what assistance might be available to you? And unfortunately, the, it's as it currently stands, it's very limited. Um, currently, secondary PSAPs are not eligible for funding under our PSAP grant program. Now, the 911 board sets those guidelines, so the 911 board could change that. They did not choose to change that for fiscal 19 grant uh, cycle, which is the one that will open July 1st. The board will be approving those guidelines at their meeting, which is uh, currently scheduled for May 31st. Um, so they haven't approved those guidelines yet, but, but as the guidelines currently stand, they would not, um, uh, peace, secondary peace house would not be eligible for funding under the grant program. However, as I mentioned, those full E911 secondary PSAPs have to get off the selective routers. So I suspect that in the 2020 um, guidelines, when the board uh, addresses this issue of, um, of, of migration to next gen 911, I suspect that the board will 
find a, there will be something in there to make sure that those uh, full E911 secondary PSAPs uh, are are able to migrate off. And it may be as simple as extending the ESI net to those PSAPs and providing what's called a legacy network gateway that would allow you to connect whatever current call handling equipment you have to the new um, ESI net. Basically, it converts from IP back to the old analog uh, trunking. So we know we have to take care of the full E911 secondary PSAPs. We don't yet know how we're going to do that. Um, there will be, however, whatever that assistance is, will likely just be one-time funding for the transition. And there will potentially be an impact to, to the local funding or the uh, ongoing costs. Um, some of the costs that we've been seeing and discussing in, around the uh, around the state and around the country does show that there are some PSAPs that will see a cost increase. Um, currently, your costs are based on subscriber count. It looks like in the future they may be more based on population. So for localities that have a difference um, where those two don't track um, proportionally, there could be a cost increase uh, to um, to a, in an individual locality. And at this point, we haven't been talking about providing any kind of ongoing funding assistance, and especially not even the primary PSAPs, let alone the secondary PSAPs. So, you know, again, we don't know who the solution provider is, so we don't know what those costs are going to be, but we do want to make sure that... Uh, uh, we understand all of that, and you understand what those costs are before uh, we move forward. Any PSAP that's currently a 10-digit or a call information relay that wants to join the ESINET, it, that cost will be on, on you. So as I mentioned, the Virginia State Police is a candidate for that. Um, you know, there are no plans to have the 911 board provide funding to the Virginia State Police or anyone else to make that conversion from a 10-digit transfer to an ESINET transfer um, uh, at, at, at this point. So I want to be upfront and make sure everybody understands, as it currently stands, secondary PSAPs would not be eligible for funding from the 9-1 board, except that we recognize we're going to have to do something to make sure that those PSAPs that are fully 9-1-1 secondary get off of the selective routers. And, but we don't know how that's going to happen yet. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about the legislation. Um, you know, it's because the board is moving forward with some legislative changes this year. Um, first, there was no legislation before 2000 or, or 1998. And in 1998, the General Assembly did two things. They created the original 911 board to give out funding, and they created a study um, basically, that it was kind of odd they did both, but um, the Northern Virginia localities were clamoring to get funding to start doing uh, wireless location technology, that old phase one and phase two stuff. Um, but a lot of the rest of the state where the state police was taking the wireless 911 calls had no desire to start taking wireless 911, and they wanted it, the issue studied first. So uh, the General Assembly did both. And the Crime Commission in 2000 issued a report they created the Public Safety Communications Division, moved the board, which had been seen as a financial board under the Comptroller of the Commonwealth, and moved it to the technology agency at the time, Department of Technology Planning, now that's VITA. It did put a requirement on every county, city, and town to provide E911 service and wireless 911, and it, it established the cost recovery model uh, for funding. It basically said if a locality incurs a dollar deploying wireless location technology, they'll be compensated a dollar. Um, in 2006 was our first major kind of rewrite of the code, and that was recognizing that that cost recovery model was was burdensome, and we instead decided, well, let's go to a formula that uh, looks at the um, basically the same information, call and call load and cost information, and then uh, creates a formula to make sure that the localities get, get money distributed. That stayed into effect until 2012 when uh, the General Assembly, to try and streamline things, decided to move 
the automatic funding or the funding, that formula funding from VITA to the Department of Taxation. So the Department of Taxation started distributing that money in 2012, and they didn't want to have a, a, an annual recalculation of that, so they instead asked for it to, to be set for five years, um, which, by the way, is up this year, uh, and the board is working on changing that funding formula now. Next slide. So if you look at our code, this is what it looks like. Um, if you go to Section 56, 44, 12 uh, through 18, that's what establishes the board. It's what tells the board how they can spend the money. Um, it's That's where it defines what a PSAP is. It defines um, uh, the requirement to have 911 uh, for each county, city, and town in, in Virginia. And it also, by the way, uh, a lot of people don't realize that pound 77 is actually mandated uh, by the code for the state police to provide. Next slide. So what we're talking about changing for next year um, is, as I mentioned, an elimination of the carrier cost recovery, um, uh, which would also allow us to remove the uh, subcommittee that was set up to review those submissions. Um, again, this is a, a cost savings measure in order to focus more funding towards next gen 911. Uh, we want it defined by code that all service providers have to provide 911 at no cost to the Commonwealth or to the PSAP. This is that notion that, you know, right now we pay Verizon and CenturyLink uh, to get the call to the PSAP. Um, we also pay the wireless carriers, but we don't pay the voice over IP carriers like Vonage. They have to get the call to the PSAP by FCC requirement with no cost recovery. So this is kind of leveling the playing field and getting rid of the technology differences and saying, um, it doesn't matter what type of service you're providing, carrier, you, you got to get the call to currently the, the selective router, but in the future, the point of interconnection at no, at no cost. It's just a cost to doing business. It's, it's something that you just need to do. Um, it establishes the need for the points of interconnection and does require the code change we're looking at would require the board to select them so that they're not cost prohibitive to the carriers. Um, you know, we can't just have one in uh, D.C. and say, you got to connect to that. It, that would be uh, cost prohibitive to the carriers. And since we're not allowing them to recover that cost, we want to make sure we take that into consideration. And then finally, one of the big changes of the code is, is requiring that the grants be focused on Next Gen 91, or at least as a priority focused on Next Gen 911. Next slide, please. So what are the next steps? Well, in the big picture of Next Gen 911, um, the first thing we need to do is get this legislative agenda passed, or otherwise we're not going to have the uh, we're not going to have the funding to be able to deploy Next Gen. Um, you know, we currently are funding the Northern Virginia project under the existing grant program, and we could do that, but it will be catch as catch can. It'll be at the PSAP's choice. Uh, to, to decide to submit a grant request or not to submit one, and we don't think that's the optimal way for us to deploy it as a commonwealth. So in order to, for us to, to have a more cohesive deployment strategy, we need the legislative changes that are being uh, recommended by the 9-1 board. So our first priority is to get those uh, passed through the General Assembly for the 2018 session. Second, is we need to determine a solution provider for the EZNet and the core services. I mentioned Fairfax uh, for Northern Virginia is in the middle of an RFP. Um, you know, we will evaluate that RFP or that uh, uh, contract once it's signed uh, to see if that has an advantage for us at a statewide level. Uh, we may go out and do our own RFP, uh, meaning VITA, to, to do it statewide uh, network. But ultimately, it will be an opt-in choice by each locality uh, and secondary piece after that matter to whether they want to use it. If they don't, if a particular reason or if the state goes a different direction than Northern Virginia, ultimately, the requirement will be that you have to be able to interconnect with the statewide uh, system. Now, in the case of Northern Virginia, it will be the other way around. The state will have to interface with them because they're they're in first. Uh, so. Um, but anyone else 
would have to make sure that you can interface seamlessly. Because again, that notion of a, of network, a system of systems or a network of networks, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, a region deciding to go it themselves and go a different direction. They just need to be able to interconnect with the locality surrounding them. Similarly, we'll be working with West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, Maryland, and D.C. Uh, to make sure that we can interconnect with them because we recognize things don't stop right on the border and uh, a call can very easily be misrouted to Danville or Pennsylvania County that needs to be in North Carolina. Um, so we need to select and figure out who that solution provider, we've also called it a trusted partner, um, so that we then can work with them to actually lay out the deployment plan, which is the, the next step in the process. Um, I, as I mentioned, the, the Regional Advisory Council Committee that was chaired by uh, Steve McMurr and Jolene Young, Steve McMurr from Fairfax and Jolene Young from Twin County, um, made some uh, recommendations on how to do it. But ultimately, we need to sit down with the, the solution provider and figure out what's the most advantageous, cost-effective, efficient way for us to deploy statewide. Um, and then we're going to need to figure out, okay, now we know what the order is. Um, you know, Chesterfield's in year two. Well, then we need to sit down with Chesterfield and develop an individual implementation plan and funding plan for that piece up to be able to make sure that they get the funding they need to be able to deploy in the time frame that we need them to deploy to get the um, the Stewart and Ch Chester selective routers decommissioned. Then we'll provide the funding for those plans. There'll be an uh, approval process by the board and funding commitment, and then we'll ultimately execute those plans to start the deployments um, to, to roll out next gen statewide. Next slide. So what does that mean to you as a secondary PSAP? Well, um, first, we need your help in identifying any and all of the full E91 secondary PSAPs. As I said, that was one of the things we hoped to really gain from this call um, or after this call is a full understanding of exactly who's impacted and to what degree. So if you're a secondary PSAP that's connected to the selective router, please let us know. We need to know about it. Um, we also need to um, need to identify any of you that would like to that isn't a full uh, E911 currently who's either doing 10 digit or call transfer or call information relay or any of those other options um, that wants to participate in the ESI net. Um, you know, this, again, my kind of poster child for this is the Virginia State Police, who I, I think we we all need to have them participating in the ESI net uh, moving forward. And then what we want to do is facilitate meetings between those secondary PSAPs and the primary PSAPs, because at the end of the day, there needs to be um, a coordination between the primary and the secondaries in any in any jurisdiction to make sure that the primary piece that knows what's happening and that the secondary piece that knows because it, it, they're going to need to convert together uh, to, to next gen. Then we need to incorporate the secondary piece app into the statewide deployment plan and potentially into the local uh, piece app individual deployment plan as well because, um, uh, you know, for some, the best solution may be to do what Fairfax did with the city of Fairfax, Vienna, and Herndon, and that is go ahead and make the secondary PSAP a node on their call handling equipment. It reduces their call handling equipment costs significantly because they don't have to worry about the backroom equipment, uh, and they're able to, to still function as a standalone PSAP, even though somebody else is maintaining the core of the call handling equipment for them. Um, and then finally, uh, for those that are going to need to be uh, moved off of the selective routers, uh, we're going to need to develop an implementation plan for the secondary PSAPs as well. Again, it could be that you would be part of the primary PSAPs plan, or it could be you have your own plan. Um, as I said, Manassas and Manassas Park are two that we know of uh, that are going to need to have implementation plans of their own unless they work out with Prince William becoming nodes on the Prince William call handling equipment. 
So, um, you know, that's where we, what we know today. That's what next gen is. It is absolutely transformational. This is probably the, uh, the largest, uh, project that I've ever, um, been involved with with 911. Um, and, and I've been doing it now 30 years. Um, because it, unlike when we did E911 in the 80s or when we did wireless 911 in the early 2000s, um, this isn't going to be able to be kind of piecemeal, do it when you feel like it, uh, and that sort of thing. We are going to have to do this in a coordinated way, Commonwealth wide, and um, we're going to need to make sure that it is 100% bulletproof from day one. And as I know I'm preaching to the choir here, and you all know this, but it's not like we can just turn off the old system, build the new one, and turn on the new system. we got to sustain, continue to sustain and maintain the old system the entire time we're doing this with the new system. So, um, any questions? that any of you have about either your role in, in, as a secondary PSAP or or um, uh, uh, you know, additional information that you'd like to have about next generation 911 or or anything uh, anything like that. And don't forget to unmute your phone when you go to ask the question. Wow, I'm surprised. Um, well, if you have any questions that come up, um, please feel free to reach out to me or even better, your your Sorry, regional Sorry, I came up with a question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. So how would this apply? Are, are there next, uh, next gen 911 requirements for a, uh, I call them a PEEP, a private enterprise? So currently, I think our, our university campus police is actually either, in terms of this scenario, a 10-digit dial-up or a relay. Um, right. From a from a campus standpoint, we are basically diverting 911 calls to our police department. We send over a uh, a file at the end of the day that gets loaded up into DayPro, so they have location and name building and all that kind of stuff. Are there any? Would there be any requirements for us uh, under next year 911 to change what we do? No, there would not be any requirements to change. What there would be is opportunities to change. Okay. And, and, and it's really a question, you know, uh, to what I encourage is, especially for campus, uh, operations or, or programs, um, and, and police departments and, and so forth is to work with the, whoever the primary PSAP is that's answering the calls. Um, you know, we, we did, we have had, uh, especially in light of some of the high profile incidents on campus, We've had a number of campuses reach out to us and, and talk about wanting to get wireless 911 calls from campus directly into the campus police. And unfortunately, the technology is not at a point where we really can do that reliably. Um, but there are probably some things working together between the, the local PSAP and the campus police that, that can be done. Um, but it, again, it's, it's starting that dialogue and trying to identify the problem that, that that everyone is working to solve and then figuring out the best way to do that. Very good. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are any other questions that come up or if you think of anything, please feel free to reach out to um, myself or your regional coordinator. If you don't know who that is, you can go to our website, which is uh, www.vita.virginia.gov slash ISP, or just go to the VITA website and look for the link to 9-1 and GIS. Um, we will have a copy of this webinar, a recording of it on our, uh, on that site in a, in a few days or a week or so. Uh, so if you want to have somebody else listen to this, you can do that as well as the presentation will be there um, uh, for you to download if you want. We're happy to come out and meet with you individually and talk about this. Um, about the subject, but we wanted to start the conversation. We wanted to make sure that you were aware of Next Generation 911 and that you understood that there likely will be an impact to you um, as uh, as we move forward. Or if there isn't an impact, there's definitely an opportunity if it makes sense. 
if there's a, a need for increased data sharing, uh, information gathering, um, and that sort of thing. We will have that ability with this network. So if there aren't any other questions, thank you very much for your time today. And uh, you know, feel free, as always, if you need anything to, to reach out to us. We don't always focus on the secondary piece apps as much as the as the, the primaries, but we are a resource here for you, um, you know, if you need anything. So thank you very much and have a great day. <laughs>